I'd like to welcome you to the American Constitution Society's Voting Rights Symposium, Political Participation, a National Conversation Examining the State of Voting Rights for 2012. I'm Caroline Fredrickson with the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. And for those of you who are not familiar with ACS, we're a national network of lawyers, law students, law professors, judges, and policymakers who believe that the law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. ACS works for positive change by shaping debate on vitally important legal and constitutional issues. As the 2012 election cycle heats up, the issue of voting rights will again be in the spotlight. In less than a year, millions of Americans will be going to the polls to cast their ballots in the next presidential election. So the timing for today's program could not be any better. We all know that there has been significant progress in this country to ensure the right to vote, but many challenges still remain. Recent changes in state voting laws, together with new redistricting maps, could have a significant impact on many elections around the country in 2012. So today we are very fortunate to have an outstanding program to sort out the impact of these changes. The participants today will explore recent developments in their discussion about the state of voting in America. Our first panel will discuss issues including the impact of photo identification requirements, proof of citizenship, voter registration restrictions, and early and absentee voting changes in state laws. We are very, very honored to have NPR's poverty and philanthropy correspondent, Pam Fessler, as our moderator for this discussion. She has produced stories on homelessness, hunger, and the impact of the recession on our nation's less fortunate. She's also reported on the governance response, the government's response to Hurricane Katrina, the 9-11 Commission investigation, Social Security, and election reform. She was NPR's chief election editor in 1996 and coordinated all network coverage of presidential, congressional, and state elections. And before coming to NPR in 1993, she was a senior writer at Congressional Quarterly Magazine. Following this morning's panel, we will hear from Tom Perez, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights for the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. And after lunch, we'll conclude the symposium with the redistricting panel, moderated by Politico's National Politics Editor, Charles Matizen. So please join me in welcoming Pam Fessler. Can I talk to you? Yeah, um, as Caroline mentioned, I have uh, I cover poverty and philanthropy, but another issue that I cover and have covered since 2000 has been election um, and voting issues, and it's it's one of my favorite topics. It's always fascinating. And one thing I was thinking when I came over here was that since 2000, every year there seems to be a big issue that emerges and a big concern that emerges around elections. First we were worried about punch card machines, then we were worried, very worried and concerned about the impact <coughs> of um, the accuracy of touchscreen voting machines which replaced the punch card machines. In subsequent elections, there were concerns started to be raised about long lines at certain polling places and whether or not certain precincts were having adequate um, um, uh, opportunity for people to vote, whether poll workers were adequately trained, and whether that, in fact, was an inhibiting um, uh, individual's ability to cast their ballots and have their votes counted. Um, then, in the subsequent elections, we started hearing a lot more about deceptive um, and uh, 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 deceptive uh, election tactics, dirty, uh, dirty tactics such as you know, all these brochures that go out and flyers that go out that tell one person to vote one way uh, on Wednesdays if you're a Democrat and to vote on Tuesday if you're a Republican or misleading information um, and, and what impact that might have on turnout. Uh, then in, in 2008, I think the, the uh, issue that emerged was voter registration. A lot of big concerns about voter registration lists and the accuracy of voter registration lists and efforts in some states to purge some of the Deadwood and other names off of um, voter registration lists and what impact that might have and challenges at the polls. And this year, 
by far the biggest concern uh, and the issue that has uh, taken prominence are all of the new laws that have been passed in states that affect um, access to the voting place, whether it's voter ID requirements or restrictions on voter registration drives or limits in the number of days that people can uh, vote early. Um, the, qu the big question, of course, for all of us is what impact those changes are going to have on who comes out to vote and also the, the, the election results. And um, another question might be how will the political parties actually use these um, new laws to their advantage, um, both pro and con. Uh, another question is, how are election officials going to deal with all these changes and try to ensure that people who, who require ID actually get the ID that they need? Um, I think another question is, is this really the big issue that we should be worried about? Is this the thing that's going to have the most impact on voters' uh, access to the polls? Or is there some other issue out there just waiting to emerge that we don't even know about? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was traveling with my husband, and I had my wallet stolen, and I suddenly found myself without any uh, photo ID, which was very unsettling <coughs> in this day and age. But it also made me wonder, what if this had happened to me the day before an election, and I was living in a state that required photo ID? Would I, for the very first time in my life, after 40 years of voting, not be allowed to cast a ballot? And why should I even have to worry about that? Um, so this is the question that we have this wonderful panel here that will help address. And first we, will ha we have Larry Norton, who is the acting director of the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice in New York. Uh, Larry is the co-author of a great Brennan Center report that came out last month, which I think is probably the most extensive uh, rundown and analysis of all the, the voting changes. Um, that have been made over the past year, and is, is I think definitely a must read for anybody in this room. We also have Laura Murphy, director of the Washington Legislative Office of the ACLU. She's a leader in legal efforts to protect voters' rights. Uh, her group is already challenging some of the recent changes, and will no doubt figure very prominently in uh, future challenges. And then to my right is John Fortier, who is now director of the Democracy Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. He's also an adjunct scholar with the American Enterprise Institute. And he helped run the AEI Brookings Election Reform Project, which spent about five years, I would say, right, looking at some of the um, big questions about how elections are run and ways that they could possibly improve, uh, be improved, especially around uh, the whole issue of uh, voter registration lists. And then finally, we have Eddie Hales, who's the General Counsel and Managing Director of the Advancement Project, one of the nation's leading civil rights advocacy groups. Uh, Hales is a longtime civil rights attorney and a former General Counsel of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, where he directed the agency's investigation of voting irregularities in Florida. <coughs> so welcome all, and uh, we'll start first with uh, Larry. Thank you. Thanks. Oh. Is, this, is this on? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Pam. Um, it's great that you're here, and, and thanks to uh, ACS for, for hosting this, to Caroline and to LaShawn and, and Sean for uh, all the arrangements and for, for CAP, of course, for, for hosting this event. Um, I, Pam mentioned our report, Voting Law Changes, in, in 2012. I'm going to spend most of my time uh, talking about that report, talking about um, that report was issued uh, just last month. It's already out of date. Uh, to some extent, so I'll talk about uh, what's changed since the report was released and kind of uh, where I see things potentially going in terms of um, changes to access to the ballot uh, in the next year before the 2012 election. Um, so uh, the, the report that, that Pam mentioned uh, analyzed uh, new laws um, and executive actions in 21 state in, um, 21 new laws and executive actions in 14 states. Uh, the Brennan Center, in examining them, estimated that um, 5 million people, it could be substantially more difficult for about 5 million people um, to, revolt, to, to vote as, as a result of these uh, changes in access um, uh, to voting. Um, uh, and we noted that of the states that have made these changes, um, they already account for about two-thirds uh, of the electoral college votes uh, needed to win the presidency. 
Um, in addition um, to uh, the laws that have passed that we looked at, there are currently 44 additional um, bills pending in 23 states, and that's just for uh, this session. Many of them, of course, uh, if they don't pass, will carry over uh, to next year, depending on the way uh, the state legislature works. Uh, we broke down these laws into five main areas. Uh, the first, which Pam already referenced, and I think it's gotten the most publicity of all the kinds of laws that have passed, um, are requirements for government-issued photo ID to vote um, and to have your vote counted. Um, but, but there are other laws. Um, there are laws in, passed in Florida and Texas and, and one now pending in Michigan um, that restrict voter registration um, either by making it much more difficult for third party groups to register voters. Um, in Maine, um, in Ohio, we saw the attempt to eliminate same day registration. Um, there have been cutbacks on early voting, that's a third category. Uh, a fourth is new requirements for proof of citizenship um, to register, having to have some, some document to prove citizenship. Uh, and then finally, uh, there has been a rollback in a couple of states of the ability of um, people who were formerly convicted of felonies um, to, to regain their right to vote. Um, Florida and Iowa, um, under Governor Christ and, and Vilsack, made it easier for people to regain those rights. Um, those were completely rolled back by the new governors in those states. I, I would say from, from um, the Brennan Center's perspective, the most important thing to know about these laws is that they're for the most part, not addressing real um, election administration <coughs> problems, um, and, and, and in fact represent a, uh, an unhealthy politicization of the rules uh, by which we run elections. Um, and a, a, as part of that, they are often drafted in a way that especially burden um, the poor, um, minorities, uh, the elderly, um, and, and students, groups that uh, under the laws to begin with um, we're, we're going to have difficult, more difficulty um, and are particularly impacted by the kinds of laws that have been passed. So first I'll talk, um, and let me know if I'm running too long, but about the voter ID laws. There are now seven um, states that have new um, requirements for government-issued photo ID uh, to vote. Um, uh, about 11% of voting age Americans do not have um, current government issued photo ID that is required under these kinds of bills, uh, under these kinds of laws. Um, and for certain groups, um, the, the statistics are much worse. Um, for young people, uh, 18 to 24 years old, 25% um, of African Americans do not uh, have this kind of ID, uh, and 18% of those 65 and older. Um, uh, but more troubling, as I, as I mentioned, uh, these laws are often drafted in a way that makes it even harder for these groups to vote. So as an example, Texas and Tennessee um, have, will not allow uh, student ID to be used, even student ID that's issued by a state institution, um, but they will allow the use of um, gun permits to vote. Um, and, and to give you an example of who that affects, um, in Texas, 16.9% um, of students at state universities are African American. Um, uh, by contrast, last year, um, only 7.7 percent of gun permits that were issued were issued to African Americans. Um, I'm going to be mentioning a, a lot of <laughs> statistics as I go through this, uh, but I do want to make the point that um, this, this actually affects real people, and Pam has done a, a great job of reporting on this. Um, there's, there have been news stories about people like Dorothy Cooper, a 96-year-old woman who has voted out of her polling place um, every election for 75 years. Um, she had a different birth certificate on, uh, name on her birth certificate than the name that she was registered in because she, she was married twice. Um, she was not allowed to use, even though she had a birth certificate, she was not allowed to use it um, when, when she went to get her ID and, so was, and was told that she could not vote at her polling place anymore. Um, there are some doctors in South Carolina. Um, oh, gosh. Well, I won't talk about the doctors in South Carolina. I'll talk about that later. Um, I, 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 I'll, I'll talk about, I just want to talk about a couple of, a couple of other um, 
types of restrictions that have really have a particular and specific impact um, on, on the groups that I was talking about. One is the new restrictions on voter registration. Um, the new law in Florida um, has forced many organizations, including the League of Women Voters, um, from doing registration drives in the state anymore. Uh, African Americans and Latinos have been twice as likely in Florida to register through these drives uh, as white voters. And um, I, I fear that the, the suspension of these kinds of uh, voter registration drives is going to mean less um, new minority registrants in Florida in the next year. Um, early voting cutbacks um, in Florida and Ohio um, seem to be specifically aimed at Sunday, uh, which is a day um, when African Americans and Latinos in particular um, were voting more heavily than the rest of the population. Um, so, you know, I, I, as I said, um, it's hard not to look at these things and, 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 and um, see them as uh, politically motivated that, rather than being motivated at solving any real election administration issue. Um, I just wanted to quickly, I have 30 seconds, um, talk about some of the things that I, I, I think we need to think about going forward. As I said, there are 44 bills um, in 23 states still pending. Um, uh, the Brennan Center is you know, particularly concerned about new laws in Michigan that are similar to the voter registration restrictions in Florida, but new potential laws in, in Virginia mm -hmm. and Pennsylvania. Um, and we also potentially, ha uh, I, I think in the next year, are going to see um, administrative actions by, by certain secretaries of state. So all this in um, 2004 to a certain extent with um, uh, Ken, Ken Blackwell in Ohio, but uh, I, I think um, just from what we've been seeing from a few secretaries of state around uh, the country in the past few months, I think we may see that on a broader, on a bigger scale uh, in this election. Again, I think election administration has become so politicized and some of the people that have been elected into office for secretary of state have actually run on uh, the kinds of issues, these kinds of issues um, that we're more likely to um, to see, to see these kinds of restrictions coming out of administrative rules that are, that are coming out of uh, those offices. Um, I, get, if I, I don't know if I have like 10 seconds left if they want me to. Um, the, the, the last thing I was just going to add is, um, I think all of this can sound very depressing, and, and I have more depressing things to add if I have time. Uh, I, I, I do think that we have to think, um, certainly we have to continue um, the fights against many of these restrictive laws, and I, I, I suppose that many of us are going to talk about those d different fights, including um, Laura, I guess, next, in terms of what kinds of litigations uh, options there may be in fighting against these laws. I, I do think we have to start thinking about pro-voter steps and, and um, steps that we can take to address actual um, election administration problems. Uh, and in particular, I would, I would point to uh, modernizing our voter registration system as an area where I think Hopefully, um, we can take the politics out of election administration, where both parties can work together um, to improve elections. Um, a lot of the fear about fraud, and, and um, which is where a lot of this comes from, and, and accusations of voter fraud actually come from um, our voter registration rolls being so poorly kept, and having so many errors in them. Working to automate registration, to get things like online registration, so that we're perfecting those roles. I mean, adding people to the roles, um, I think might be a way that both parties can work together um, to actually address a real problem that will help voters. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Pam. And thanks, Caroline. And um, LaShawn and Sean, I love to see my ACLU alumni <laughs> folks. And I want to recognize Deb Bagans, who's been a leader at the ACLU on voting issues, and Georgia Yusova, who's also a young attorney taking great interest in this area. You know, I think I would challenge the thesis that this is a post-2000 problem. I think this is a perennial, a chronic American problem. We've had problems uh, protecting the franchise. Um, implicitly, the franchise was protected by the First Amendment. But in 1868, we passed the 14th Amendment. In 1870, we ratified the 15th Amendment. Um, in 1920, we ratified the 19th Amendment, giving uh, women the right to vote. In 
We ratified the 24th Amendment in 1964, in my lifetime, prohibiting the poll tax. And then we uh, ratified the 26th Amendment in 1971, uh, allowing citizens as young as 18 to vote. But all of these uh, amendments were accompanied by struggles about who should vote and who should not vote. And so I think what we're just seeing in this decade is the modern incarnation of the hostility toward voting that's always been part of the American political landscape, even as we celebrate the opportunity to vote in Arab Spring nations as recently as Egypt this week. So um, not only have we had to resort to constitutional amendments to protect this right, but we've also uh, had to passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and that came after tremendous brutality in the nation. Police dogs, fire hoses, people being beaten and fired from their jobs and killed in some cases. And so Congress saw fit to enact the, that law, and we all, many of our groups worked hard to get it extended in 1980, 1982 and again in 2006. <clears throat> But then we also had a concern about low voter turnout and low voter registration rates that led to the National Voter Registration Act adopted in 1993. And then we had the reaction to Bush v. Gore in the Help America Vote Act in 2002. So I think we have a chronic American problem and that our challenge is to build our institutions up to the point where we can respond on behalf of all Americans who have their right to vote threatened. And uh, the Brennan Center has done an outstanding job chronicling how these voter suppression measures have been enacted in state legislatures recently. Um, so we know that the most adversely affected groups are going to be um, African Americans and other minority groups, but we also have to be concerned about the poor, senior citizens, religious minorities, the disabled, and students. And so the ACLU is responding to this patchwork a quilt of new voter suppression laws, but that patchwork quilt rests upon the laws that already exist to disenfranchise people who have criminal convictions. About 5.3 Americans cannot vote because of prior <coughs> criminal convictions, and they've served their debt to society, but all kinds of barriers have been set up to exclude them from the process. So we have a complicated problem, and I see it as a manifestation of that of the new state's rights, the state's reacting to what the promise of the 14th Amendment would be, what the promise of the 15th Amendment would be. So uh, I could go into detail of what we, we're doing here in Washington. We met with the Attorney General along with many coalition partners. I'm excited to say that next week the Attorney General is giving a speech uh, on December 13th, I guess in two weeks, um, in Austin, Texas, a major speech on voting, and, and we've been pushing him hard to do that because we think it is a national crisis. But the thing that um, LaShawn and others asked me to talk about today is how we are challenging these new voter suppression laws in the courts. And I think it's worth beginning with the 2005 law that was, was enacted in Indiana that led to the Supreme Court decision in Crawford v. Marion County Election Board. Um, in 2008, the Supreme Court declined to find that Indiana's voter ID requirement violated the Constitution per se, based in significant part on the majority's failure to be persuaded that it would in fact be prohibitively onerous for qualified voters in general to obtain <coughs> the, the required ID. And that was despite lots of evidence that people had to travel long ways to get to county seats, people had to pay lots of money to get primary documents like birth certificates. They didn't find it was burdensome. The court gave too much deference, in our view, to Indiana in burdening the right to vote, even though there was no evidence that in-person voting fraud was a problem. The court's decision in Crawford, however, noted that the burden may not be justified as to some voters and left open the possibility and likelihood that the courts will find voter ID requirements unconstitutional in as-applied challenges. So while the cases that the ACLU is, are, is bringing are much harder now, we're still bringing them. And um, we are accumulating the real experiences of minority, elderly, disabled, and low-income and student and homeless voters. Um, the ACLU and its affiliates are continuing this fight, identifying disenfranchised citizens in order to prove that, as applied, the laws do, in fact, disenfranchise people. 
For example, the ACLU is litigating in several states to challenge the spread of laws requiring photo IDs to vote. In Missouri, the ACLU and its allies have sued on behalf of eight voters facing probable disenfranchisement to stop or alter misleading language approved from a 2012 ballot measure which would amend the state constitution to allow for a voter ID requirement. Our clients include elderly women, 90 and 86, who no longer drive and would have great physical and financial difficulty obtaining necessary documents, a former musician who now suffers with multiple sclerosis and is confined to a wheelchair whose ID has expired, and on and on, people, um, students, former school board members. So we've amassed, I think, a group, a, a credible group of plaintiffs there. The important thing is not just the harm to these individuals, however, but the larger group they represent. Millions of people who won't know of these restrictions and will be turned away from the polls on election day. The ACLU is also interviewing affected voters and considering litigation in Wisconsin where we've identified many individuals who will be negatively affected. And I won't go through the list of those individuals. But I just have to say that these cases are expensive and time consuming because we have to provide data to, to show the disparate impact of these voting laws. Um, so what we've also been doing is pressuring the Justice Department to invoke Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act to make sure that it's ro robustly enforced. Um, earlier this year, for example, we submitted a comment letter objecting to Florida's application to the Department of Justice for preclearance of their newly enacted restrictions on third party voter registration, early voting, and more. And after Florida withdrew its application to the Department of Justice and filed suit seeking preclearance in the DC court for the District of Columbia, we successfully secured permission from the court to intervene on behalf of voters from Monroe, Hillsborough, Collier counties, which are covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And the case remains pending before the district court. So we are also looking at litigation in Texas, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Alabama. And the big question is, what will the Department of Justice do? And that's why we're so excited about the Attorney General's upcoming speech. To our knowledge, they've only brought one Section 2 case. And Section 2 allows the court, where there is evidence of a disparate impact on racial minorities, it allows, rather, individuals and DOJ to bring suit in states that are not covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And why has there only been one case, at least one case to our knowledge? Maybe they will announce more. So, we are using the National Voter Registration Act, the Help America Vote Act, to um, push back. We're using Section 2 and Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and we're using the Constitution. But I don't think we should limit our, um, our hope for salvation to litigation. I think litigation is expensive, it's time consuming, and the courts have shown some hostility um, so I think what we have to do is what was done in Maine and Ohio. We also have to beat back efforts to suppress the vote through grassroots mobilization to, um, to oppose ballot initiatives. Uh, so I think it's sort of like Brown versus Board of Education. You can win in the, in the courts, but if you don't win in the court of public opinion, you're still going to see uh, the state legislatures um, uh, enact these kinds of repressive measures. And, and the last thing I'll say is that I think that even though this is a, an effort that seems dominated by the Republican Party, um, this historically the Democratic Party has tried to do these things, the Republican Party has tried to do these things, and right now it's a mostly Republican effort <coughs> to try to suppress the vote. But I think we have to remain nonpartisan in our advocacy and recognize that in Rhode Island, the effort to push fo uh, photo ID was spearheaded by an African American leader in the Rhode Island State Legislature, and that in Arkansas, the mostly Republican uh, oriented Baptist students were rebuffed by a mostly Democratic controlled registrar in their ability to vote. So, the problem goes both ways. So we've got to remain nonpartisan. We've got to use litigation.
but we also have to mobilize grassroots understanding of why these suppression me measures are unconstitutional, unfair, and short-sighted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for uh, having me here again. I will say that uh, I'll make one admission. I've been here on panels before and was proudly carrying around a copy of the Constitution put out by the American Constitutional Society, but <laughs> technology has now moved me to have it on my phone. So I, I'm not sure that's a good uh, good development, but if you still have these, uh, come back. I recommend uh, that, uh, that all I'll of you, you mind. take one out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to turn my phone off for the, for the uh, panel, so I'm, I'm stuck. Um, but thank you for having me here. I think in some ways I'm, I'm expected to play the role of the skunk of the garden party a bit, and I won't completely disappoint on that. Uh, but I, but I guess I, I want to make the point that uh, at the end of the day, we uh, there's a certain sort of balance that is required, and uh, the concerns of uh, to oversimplify the concerns of the left about access and the concerns of the right about integrity somehow need to be put together, and they're not unreasonable concerns, uh, at least at the level of theory. And at the end of the day, the goal is to make a system where uh, eligible people can vote without onerous hurdles, uh, but also that people who are not eligible shouldn't vote, and that the system is relatively transparent for people to, to feel comfortable in, in both directions on that. Um, with that said, there's no surprise, I think, that with changes in elections, with changes in the state legislatures, uh, that we saw a significant move towards Republican control of state legislatures, that you see laws that are more uh, concerned about integrity, more concerned about uh, regulation of uh, registration, regulation of voter IDs, uh, questions of the time and place and role of early voting. Um, but of course, when you see Democratic wave elections, you see Democratic legislatures uh, putting, putting laws forward which look at uh, same day registration and other expansion of modes of voting. So it's not, not surprising that we see this, and I don't think it's completely nefarious. I think many people are, uh, have, have good motives in this, uh, but you know, there are different visions of this, and I think the ideal is to, to find a way to, to, to get at both concerns. Um, one thing I'm going to stress is that we should put some of these claims in perspective. Uh, I think you'll hear on this panel, and I, I agree with this uh, to a great degree, that, that voter ID laws are probably not the best way of getting at uh, significant fraud problems, whether there are significant fraud problems and where, whether you can identify them in these uh, narrow cases of people impersonating other people at the, at the voting booth, uh, those are you know, not, not widespread activities and probably not uh, worth the uh, you know, strong hammer that a, that a voter ID law might, might, um, uh, might put there. Uh, but I will say also I think that some of the claims about the way in which these laws are going to drive down turnout and uh, scare people from voting or be tremendous hurdles are also exaggerated. And I, I, I would be cautious in this area. And I, I don't want to pick on Larry because I think uh, his report and many reports are, are uh, out of the Brennan Center are, are very worthwhile looking at. But the, the number that they put at the front of the report that says 5 million voters will be, find it significantly harder to vote. Um, I find that difficult to believe. And I'm not sure what significantly harder means. If you mean uh, it's 50-50, half of those people won't be able to vote because of these laws, I think that's, that's um, you know, very unlikely. And I can go through some of the, uh, some of the specifics of um, how they got to those numbers and how, how some of the areas that, that people are worried about, I think, are overstated. Uh, voter ID. Uh, I mentioned that there you know, isn't a lot of evidence that there's uh, in-person voter fraud. Uh, I, uh, one's hard to find, but I think it's also probably not there, except in you know, small and isolated cases. Uh, but you know, Republicans and, and those on the right point to messy registration lists, uh, people who are not eligible, people who are not, uh, people who, who would have uh, insider schemes with insiders in polling places, using names on registration lists in a way to have votes cast in uh, other people's names, absentee ballots, which wouldn't be affected by voter ID, but uh, would have the possibility of people on lists uh, having absentee ballots cast for them. There are, there are significant worries. And I, while I don't make the claim that there is widespread fraud, uh, it's a bit like saying you're in a safe neighborhood and therefore you leave your doors open all the time, and that you don't think about these things. Uh, there are reasonable reasons for wanting some of these restrictions, uh, less nefarious than, than sometimes portrayed. Uh, voter ID is popular in most polls. 60-70% of the people tend to support uh, voter ID restrictions or voter ID requirements. Um, it's common in when we promote elections in emerging democracies that we either want some form of ID or we want a very low-tech form of ID, like sticking your finger in a, 
and some indelible paint so we know that you and you voted only once. Uh, and truthfully, many of these states have outlets, uh, whether it's swearing an affidavit, you don't have your ID, uh, pre-IDs, alternative IDs. Uh, again, some of, some of the uh, states are more restrictive than others, but uh, many states have expired IDs or out-of-state IDs or IDs that don't match your your current residents are still acceptable IDs. So uh, they're not all the, the same, and I think that the, the effect is not likely as, uh, as great as, as we say. Uh, I also think that the figure 11% is probably um, in dispute. There's certainly different studies that 11% of people not having IDs. It depends on what kind of ID you mean, whether you're talking about uh, all voting age people or registered voters or, uh, you know, frankly, I don't think we've studied it enough. I think we have a few studies out there that both right and left like to point to, uh, but it's not as widely study this as one might think. Uh, early voting. Here I'm going to make a probably even a stronger criticism. I, I'm going to make a plug for my book. Absentee and early voting. It's almost Christmas time. You can put that my suffering soccer. It's actually a few years old, so maybe it's, uh, uh, it's a little out of date. Um, and as you can imagine, with the title Early and Absentee Voting Trends, Promises, and Perils, it has been a bestseller. Um, but, you know, my, my, my Without all the details, my, my worry in the, in the book is a little bit about, more about voting uh, by mail, the great expansion of it, but I'm not uh, against voting early. I, I'm one who thinks that an early voting period is actually a good thing, but I do think that what's clear from the research in political science is that there really is no great voter turnout boost from these kinds of voting. Uh, in fact, many people think it's uh, either a negative or at least no turnout change at all. Uh, you have the same people tending to vote, whether it's voting one day at election day, voting multiple days in early voting, voting you know, at home in their kitchen table with voting by mail. Uh, however you do it, the, the studies are, are pretty clear for, for many years that there isn't a great turnout benefit. That doesn't mean there might not be other reasons for doing it. Administrators like it. There's a greater convenience, and I, I like the early voting in person in, in many ways. Uh, but the idea that somehow uh, this type of voting, because it has made things easier, has, has allowed lots more people to vote, uh, is, I think, uh, not supported by the research. Uh, and the, the criticism of many states is that they're cutting back on early voting. And here I think the evidence is a bit mixed again. I have been an advocate for a, a shorter early voting period. I don't have an exact number, seven to ten days, to me seems like a reasonable amount. Uh, more is not always better. Having 30 days of early voting doesn't get you more voting than seven to ten days of voting. And uh, what our experience is that you sometimes have a, a boost uh, big surge at the beginning of an early voting period, a few days where people are excited about it, they hear about it, uh, then a lull, and then toward the end of the early voting period, another, another big surge. The idea that somehow these early voting periods are so crowded with lines day after day for 20, 30 days, and cutting back would be, uh, would be harmful to voter turnout, I think is, is not the case. Um, I mentioned the Sunday. Uh, I actually am a fan of having the early voting run up as close to <coughs> voting on election day as possible. Much of the objection to that is from uh, election administrators who think that they need to secure the early voting sites, make sure that those machines are either moved to other places, are, are properly uh, uh, votes tabulated or votes at least kept in, in, in secure ways so that, that there's a, a counting of things. And they want a little break. I, I would like to see that uh, come about, that we have a shorter period. Uh, one minute. So I'm, I'm gonna, here I'm going to move to my last point is, is some agreement, I think, with. Uh, with Larry's point, uh, registration. I, I actually think there are, you know, there are a lot of reasons why I, I think states would put re restrictions on registration. They're worried about a very messy system. But my, my take on this is that the system is very bad for all sides, very bad for the right, very bad for the left. Uh, it's very messy uh, that we rely on uh, third party groups who uh, might turn in lots of registrations at the last minute, who uh, unsavory actors might. Uh, not turn in certain registrations from some people who they, they think wouldn't vote the way they would, would be paid or incentivized to put lots of people on the list whether they were eligible voters or not. I mean, that's, that's not a good system. And, and from the right, it's, it's also not a good system that, that you know, many people are not checked out, that you don't have some sense of uh, you know, whether they are eligible, eligible voters or not. And so I do think a system where, like I mentioned, that would have a greater role for, uh, for government or at least for um, <laughs> checking out people in advance and having some sense of who eligible voters are in advance. Uh, it might involve uh, some online registration. It might involve uh, governments and others identifying people who are eligible and not eligible. 
but it would have to go with making these lists very clean as well. It, it, uh, I think the right is not going to accept a system that says, let's find all the people who are registered, throw them on the list, and let's not clean up all of the duplicates, all of the, the messiness that we have in the system, all of the not being able to, to uh, compare across states. So I, I do think, in some ways, I think that's the biggest issue. The others, I think, are smaller, that, that if we would have a better registration system, one that would uh, more actively seek to identify voters in advance and make sure that they're eligible, uh, we would have fewer administrative as well as fewer disagreements on left and right on that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Pam, and uh, thank you, Caroline, and uh, LaShawn and Sean for this uh, invitation. I'm, I'm very grateful I, to be here. I look around the room and I see uh, colleagues who could easily take my place and provide uh, useful uh, insights. Uh, um, I, I see uh, Nita, Nicole, I see uh, so many folks, uh, Debbie, who could, uh, Lisa, who could actually talk about some of the issues that you raised, uh, John. I, I realize that, um, you know, we're not going to eliminate barriers to voting with uh, reports and with books, but they do help to highlight some of the problems uh, we're experiencing in this election cycle. Uh, right now, in, in, is, we don't have a single democracy. Uh, we have closer to 13,000 uh, separate uh, sets of rules and regulations across the country about who can vote and, and how to vote. And so even as we talk about specific states uh, that have actually enacted new laws and those that have legislative proposals uh, that are pending, uh, we still recognize that it's kind of actually come down to the way in which election officials interpret and implement uh, the rules and regulations uh, that are encompassed in some of the legislative proposals we're beginning to see. And so while uh, those of us here uh, represent uh, uh, national groups with local partners and local entities, uh, Laura, uh, we realize that the battle will actually be at the local level. We may have this 10,000 uh, uh, foot view, but we know that actually what's going to happen on election day uh, will happen in places where uh, the voices of local people will make a big difference. And so part of the fight back uh, strategy I think will make the most sense is to have these uh, relationships with groups on the ground that, 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 that find unique and creative ways to, to meet with election officials and to discuss with specificity some of the, uh, the issues that have been raised uh, in this discussion. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, the number may be up to five million, it may not. John didn't offer uh, a number, but we know that uh, these new laws will be difficult for certain uh, groups, including people of color who are poor, uh, the chronologically gifted, certain students, people with disabilities. There will uh, be some very significant uh, barriers for people who will find it difficult to get the unique, very specific type of state-sponsored ID that is now being required to, to establish the eligibility of folks who have been um, uh, voting for years. So if, if you want to know where the numbers come uh, from, you begin to look at people who are currently uh, registered, are on the voter registration rolls, and yet do not have the state-specific IDs that are now being required. And you could do the matches. We've seen the matches done by election officials, for example, in South Carolina, and you, you will know that the hundreds of thousands of people currently don't have it. Now, you may say that they can get them, uh, but it, 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 it then forces you to, to recognize that there are certain costs involved. There are certain uh, issues involving where you could get that state-specific ID and how um, often the offices that provide the specific type of ID are, are open. We know uh, in Texas, for example, that because of budget constraints, uh, certain uh, uh, DMVs have closed and for a person a poor person to get a, 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 a required ID if the, the law in fact is uh, enacted would mean traveling over a hundred miles and uh, that's a significant cost factor for poor people who may work different shifts. How many we don't know but we live in a democracy where we believe every vote counts and so if it's a problem it should be resolved. I believe it's going to be resolved at the local uh, level 
where local leaders are going to meet with election officials and with the assistance of groups that are doing the type of research that has been revealed uh, in this discussion and some of the litigation uh, strategies uh, that have been also discussed but in cooperation with these uh, local folks you're going to, to find the election officials who are open to doing um, uh, creative things will make it easier for people to vote even in states where these restrictions are now in place. We uh, know for example that in Florida um, where the um, uh, HR HB 1355, a vote <coughs> suppression uh, law is uh, currently uh, 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 pending approval. Uh, it's going through the pre-clearance process and in certain counties that uh, the election officials are saying if you register in, in our county, uh, we will, uh, even if you don't live in our county, we will process your voter registration application without regard to the current uh, law while it's pending and make certain that you get added to the voter registration role. So within the discretionary authority of certain election officials that want to increase uh, participation, that want to expand our electorate, make it more diverse, and make more voices count in our elections, you're going to see uh, some things happen that will not always be uh, highlighted in newspaper articles and reports and books, but at the same time more voters will have opportunities uh, to participate. Uh, there are a number of people in this room who are continuing advocacy with the Department of, of, of Justice. There are folks who are working with uh, strategic communications teams to make sure that when we talk about these laws, we are referring to them as voter suppression laws and, and we're not just calling them voter ID laws, people provide some form of ID to vote already. So these are, these are new, they're restrictive, they are very specific, and they harm certain groups, and we have to talk about the people who are without the state-specific uh, voter IDs, as opposed to just focusing on the laws themselves. We need to talk about uh, the people that Laura talked about in the lawsuit uh, in, in Missouri. Um, there we know that there's a valid initiative that is misnamed the Voter Protection uh, Act. So we know that there are people who are trying to contract the electorate and suppress um, uh, the, the people of color from participating in particular are using language that has been used historically by persons who are trying to expand the electorate and work on behalf of vulnerable uh, people who have historically been disenfranchised. So strategic communication, advocacy with the, the Department of, uh, of, of Justice, um, of working together collaboratively at, at the local level, getting in the heads of election officials, not always in their faces, will produce, we believe, opportunities to uh, enhance and increase the opportunities for people who have historically been locked out of the ballot box to be able to participate in, in meaningful ways. I'm uh, fortunate today to be joined by my colleague uh, Rochelle Faithful, who is a Equal Justice Works a fellow with Advancement Project, who is working on a project to end lifetime disenfranchisement uh, in, in Virginia, uh, one of the few former slave states that continues to uh, make it impossible nearly for people with past felony convictions to regain their, their citizenship rights and to, to, to vote in our democracy. So there are a number of challenges, a number of barriers. There are a lot of groups that fortunately are working collaboratively together, doing top-notch research, um, lit litigating in strategic ways, providing strategic communications uh, support to local <coughs> groups to uh, ensure that we have a uh, just democracy. Great. Thank you very much. Well, first, um, I'm going to ask a few questions, hopefully we'll get a little discussion started, and then we will turn it over to you guys, because I'm sure you have lots and lots of questions. Um, one thing I want to, as, as, as I think John kind of noted, I think this is a little bit of a one-sided, somewhat one-sided um, panel. Um, so I would actually like to play a little bit of devil's advocate as well, um, and, and sort of 
uh, taking up what you said, I, I also have had concerns about these numbers that were in the Brennan report. Not only the numbers that you guys have used, but that you know that I keep hearing reports about the extent of the impact of some of these changes. And I'd like to just sort of raise some questions about that five million five million voter uh, figure, which I've. You guys, when you did your report, you kind of cushioned it a little bit. You said, I'm just trying to find the words here. You said these new laws could make it significantly higher, higher, harder for more than 5 million eligible voters. But I've seen that 5 million figure used on television saying 5 million voters will not be able to vote as a result. You know, just that. But, but when you look at those figures, um, about 3 million of, it, those, uh, of those voters that you use come from people who you say don't have the current state uh, issued voter ID. But as, as John noted, a lot of states are providing free voter ID. They actually have outreach programs that they're working on. So presumably, many of these people will, in fact, be able to get voter ID. And then the, the last one is that the, about 1 to 2 million of that 5 million are people who voted on early voting days that have been canceled. In states. Presumably those people will have no problem voting, or not, not all of them, but some of them will have no problem voting on another early voting day or casting yeah. an absentee back. So, you know, could you justify these numbers a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. I, I mean, first of all, I, you're right. I think we were very careful in the, in, in the words we selected. We did not want to imply that 5 million people are not going to be able to vote because of these laws. What we're talking about um, was an increase in barriers um, to give a sense of the scope of who is going to be impacted by this. That doesn't mean that those people aren't going to be able to vote. It means they're going to be impacted by this. Um, and um, I, I think that number gives a sense of, uh, of potentially, um, if you have a number that big shows potentially that, you know, even, even if it's 10% uh, of the people that end up, of that number that end up not voting, that's a huge um, number. In terms of the, F, the, the free IDs, um, Free IDs are not so free. Um, but f first of all, I, I would say that in general, the, the outreach and education efforts that states have been doing ha has been in totally inadequate. Um, uh, but second of all, um, there, are, there are all kinds of complaints from people that are going to get these free IDs where, first of all, they're not told that they're free when they go there and say that they don't have, them, that they don't have money to pay for them, um, have to wait on long lines. And then if they don't have underlying documentation, um, they can't get them, and so they have to they have to go out and buy that, that documentation. I, I was going to mention these doctors from South Carolina, um, who um, have a clinic where, in the past, they have always registered. They have a clinic um, working with poor people in a rural part of South Carolina. Um, had always uh, registered uh, voters, uh, and n now came across the problem of this new law and um, wanted to help people get IDs. Uh, but found that many of these people uh, didn't have their birth certificates. And it wasn't just, okay, we can tr try to help you get your birth certificate, even if, the, even if these people had the money and were willing to pay for the birth certificate, which can be, you know, $15, $25, $35, dollars, which is no small amount to, to have to vote for somebody that's very poor. Um, they might not have had the credit cards um, that they needed to order those, um, uh, to, 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 to order those birth certificates. Um, so it, it happens that these doctors have been very generous and have helped people um, to purchase those birth certificates so they can go ahead and get those IDs. But you can see that there are many, there are many levels to this that go beyond um, just whether or not somebody, um, whether or not a state is offering a free ID, which, which they have to do um, by law. So I, it's not out of the generosity of, these, uh, of the state legislators who have passed these laws that they're offering these free IDs. It's because they have to do it. Um, I do want to make a, a point about that 11% number. I, I don't really think, John, that that, is, that number is in dispute. It's true. There are always studies that say different things. Um, but, but I think the, uh, the and, and this is the difficulty of talking about studies on a panel like this, um, the Brennan Center has written a lot about the different studies that are out there. Um, there are, I, I, I really only know of two studies that have taken issue with the general number of 11%. And there's, there are serious methodological problems with those studies. Um, most importantly, um, they don't adjust, they, they, did, they did not adjust for um, or wait for uh, the populations that, that all the other studies, uh, and, and, and this was, the, the authors of uh, the study that I'm thinking of admitted that this was a problem with their study. Um, they didn't wait for the populations that are particularly impacted um, by these laws, um, people of color, 
um, and the poorest citizens, they, they didn't adjust in their survey um, for those populations. And that's, you know, that's kind of a violation of basic um, uh, polling methodology. Um, in addition, one of the studies, um, it was a 2006 study, um, asked people uh, if they weren't able to vote because they didn't have ID. In 2006, uh, I think the only state that had an ID law comparable to the ones that we're talking about was Indiana. And you can vote if you don't have an ID in Indiana. Your vote just won't count. You'll get a provisional ballot. Um, so a lot of people may have been under the impression that they voted, um, but, but in fact their vote didn't count. Um, I, I, and I don't want to monopolize the time in, in, in responding to this, but I, I guess I would say um, uh, we did, I, 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 I want to take a little bit of an issue with something that Laura said earlier. We did not include Rhode Island's law when we were looking at this estimate. Um, I think Rhode Island's law is different. Um, Rhode Island uh, allows many different kinds of photo ID, not just very specific kinds of photo IDs that certain people don't have. And there is the kind of alternative that John talked about. Um, you can vote on a provisional ballot, and if your signature matches, you, you, you provide another way to identify yourself. Um, your vote will count. And I do think that that is the way that um, the folks on our side talk about this issue can be a little bit of a problem because we talk about um, ID and having to identify yourself. And I don't think the, that's not really the issue um, in, this in this debate. The issue is, do you require IDs that people don't have? And if they don't have it, tell them that their vote can can't count. Even if <coughs> they're otherwise eligible to vote, um, you don't provide them with any other way uh, of, of um, verifying who they are. Um, so I, yeah, can I, yeah. Uh, I, I just am very concerned, though, that that the the that we're getting into the numbers, as and we have a concept here in our constitution that's been reinforced mm -hmm. several times that voting is a, is an emblem of citizenship, that it's fundamental, and so it seems to me whether it's five million or five hundred we should not allow people's constitutionally protected right to be encumbered in any way. And I don't think there's any difference in, in I don't take issue with how you characterize, characterize Rhode Island, but I think whether you have to show an affidavit or whether you can show multiple IDs, that these, um, these are suppression tactics at their core, and they're not justified by the constitutional values that we embrace. And so, I mean, you look at a case like Citizens United where you had one nonprofit saying that their First Amendment right uh, was violated because they couldn't show Hillary the movie. And the court uh, undid a whole swath of campaign finance laws by that one nonprofit. But yet, our court will not say for one voter, if one voter is unfairly disenfranchised, these laws should be struck down. So I think. The premise has got to change. It shouldn't be, well, it's not so bad. It's a, it only hurt a few people. It should be, no, as, a, as, a, as a, a standard practice, we should do everything we can not to encumber the franchise. And actually, that my, was my question for John, because you talk about the need to balance um, access and the integrity of the system. But, you know, as Laura points out, I mean, no matter what the numbers are, there will be some people who are not able to vote because of these new restrictions, and is it that worth it even for, um, why, why is it worth doing? People so, who are entitled to vote, exactly. not people like, right, who shouldn't right, vote. Right, exactly. Sure, uh, no, no, I, I, um, you know, I, I think everybody entitled to vote should vote, and people who are not entitled to vote shouldn't vote. Now, the second part of that is, uh, you know, people who are voting, if you, if you find you're voting, and a lot of people who are not entitled to vote voting, your vote is diluted. That's, I mean, that's, uh, uh, argument may be made sometimes too strongly on the right, but I think there's some truth to that. And, and we shouldn't, um, I mean, if we wanted a system where we said, well, there are absolutely no restrictions on voting, we wouldn't have registration at all, we wouldn't ask for anything. In fact, there are many states that, oddly enough, ask for you to just state your name, right? state your name and address. I mean, that, to, to me, that's pretty surprising, right? I, I can see what, some problems of overly restrictive photo ID laws, but you know, that's pretty far in the other direction, that you just show up and say, you know, here. Here's who I am. Nobody checks you, or you sign in. That's another thing, which you know, signatures are never checked. So I, you know, I, I agree that we should eliminate hurdles to uh, to voting, but that doesn't mean that very practical 
point that we want to know who you are when you're voting and that you vote once and that you're eligible to vote. Uh, those are equally potentially uh, disruptive of the franchise, cutting down the influence of your vote by having people who shouldn't be voting vote. Um, I mean, I, I, um, I'm a very pro-immigration person, but you brought up the issue, you said it's an emblem of our citizenship. I mean, one obvious uh, criticism is, well, how, you know, we want to make sure that, that all say citizens vote, that citizens should vote, non citizens shouldn't vote. Uh, we don't, it's very controversial and maybe done in a ham handed way of, of how we get to that point, but we should be able to, we should be able to determine that people who are citizens should vote. And if, you're, if you're not there, if it's by accident or if you're just trying to vote, uh, when you shouldn't be voting, you shouldn't be able to vote. And so I, you know, I think it, it, affects the, it affects the franchise on the other side. Uh, I don't know exactly how you describe how you. Uh, strike that balance, but uh, it certainly can't be, if there's any ever anything that makes it a little bit harder to vote, uh, that also makes it easier for all of these other you know, potential people who are not even eligible to vote to vote, that shouldn't be the standard that we that we. But where is the beef? Where is the evidence that there's widespread in-person voting fraud? Where is the beef? We could not find any evidence in Indiana that they ha that the legislature went through a process to demonstrate that there was widespread fraud justifying their voter ID bill. And so we, we worked on the Help America Vote Act to get at the very issues you talked about. They were raised by Bush v. Gore. We, want, we gave resources to state registrars uh, to um, clean up their voter registration list. So we, the Congress has spoken, it empowered people, and if this administration would just uh, uphold the National Voter Registration Act and the Help America Vote Act and vigorously enforce the Voting Rights Act, um, then we would we probably would have fewer problems. But I have to give them a lot of credit for building up the department they have and they're trying to do it. But but still we have we have laws on the books to address the very issues you've raised. And if we just enforce those laws, we wouldn't need this patchwork quilt of state laws. I guess one question I always have had is that if, you know, the, the, the harm is, there's so much harm to voters and that so many voters are being effective and that, 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 that there's clear-cut evidence that people are being disenfranchised, and maybe you can answer this first, Andy, and then, then you, Laura. Why has it been so difficult to challenge these in court? Why, why has there, you, why have you not had more success in the courts challenging these laws if they're so, if, if they are so um, harmful? Well, the, the truth of the matter is we, we've had success in the past. Um, many of these cases have not yet been uh, totally <laughs> resolved. Uh, cases are being worked up, investigations are underway, uh, evidence is being uh, secured and uh, being prepared for a presentation um, using the proper evidentiary uh, uh, standards. But um, uh, we also face a judiciary that, um, well, as a member of the bar, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> um, but, but at the same time, I think that, uh, as Laura mentioned earlier, um, uh, litigation is uh, expensive, it's uh, protracted, um, so we haven't brought a lot of cases, but I, 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 I think that what we're beginning to see, um, especially since our uh, United States uh, Constitution uh, uh, does not have an express affirmative uh, uh, constitutional right to vote, um, and that certain states do, maybe 28 out of uh, uh, 50 states uh, actually has an expressed affirmative uh, right to vote provision that and it's time to look at certain state uh, laws and constitutional um, um, issues as opposed to some of the federal litigation that is taking place so far. Yeah, I just think the court has been, uh, the, the Supreme Court has been very deferential to the fact that uh, voting is largely a state operation and so They've deferred to the assertions of the states that fraud, that fraud prevention is behind these laws, and they have not gone deep into the evidentiary um, uh, matters. And so I, I think that the judiciary right now, is, especially the Supreme Court, is, is somewhat hostile. But again, I want to emphasize 
that we will be bringing as applied challenges to some of these laws. If I could just add one quick thing, is I, I, just to add to that. I mean, in fact, I think there were a lot of, uh, there were a number of successful cases brought before, before Crawford. I mean, now we're just talking about ID, but uh, in, in other areas as well. Um, and we had a court that essentially said um, that uh, you, you can't have a facial challenge unless you actually have to show people being disenfranchised uh, by the law. So, um, you know, there was, there, there probably, the, the plaintiffs who brought that action probably did not um, uh, have, bring the record that they should have for that case. Um, but in any case, um, uh, you know, and we now have, <laughs> we'll now have several more opportunities to build up a record because the, the, the face of, of these laws has changed so much since that decision and there are so many more of these, um, uh, there's going to be so much more evidence to bring as a result of the fact that so many of these laws have passed. Can I just throw out one thing to, to whoever, and then we'll turn over to the audience, and that is, um, it, it does seem to me that um, the, the left and, and, and Democrats have in some ways benefited politically from a lot of these efforts, that they've been able to use it to generate, um, um, e either to get the, the base, you know, um, sort of uh, activated and, and, and riled up saying somebody's trying to steal your voting rights and that they've also used it um, to, to raise money um, for voter protection um, efforts and maybe you talk a little bit about how much you think that politics is really really what's driving this and I mean is there some truth to the fact that Republic I mean that Democrats benefit a little bit from these um, some some of these efforts well, I, this, the ACLU is certainly not an echo chamber for the Democratic <coughs> Party. And the same day that uh, Ohio and Maine uh, rallied to uh, take um, the, put these issues, these restrictive issues, on the ballot, uh, Mississippi um, enacted uh, a voter suppression law. So I don't think I, I can't even imagine any scenario you know, in the Democratic Party, and I can't speak for the Democratic Party, but I can't imagine a scenario where they would want this to happen so that they could raise more money. They need the votes. Uh, there are a lot of swing states. Uh, the control of the Senate is in the balance. Uh, the control of the White House is in the balance. Some people argue that the control of the House is in the balance. I, you know, a lot of predictions are that the House will remain Republican. I just, I don't see any reason why the Democratic Party would want to make this into an issue when there's so many other issues like unemployment and the economy that are of great concern to the party leadership. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just think people are of, of good faith here, that, that yeah. people have different worldviews and issues that they emphasize, but that somehow some narrow interest that they, you know, Democrats in this case, think by you know, having these laws they'll raise money, or Republicans. You know, I, I actually think Republicans are, are generally well-intentioned as well in their you know, public opinion. We're divided on a lot of things politically, and, and for the most part, people have uh, strong worldviews on these things. Uh, you know, I think we need to find, find a way to combine some of these worldviews, and there's some very practical ways, and again, I think on, on registration. Um, could I you know, say, I guess, two other things? One about uh, going a little bit back to early voting. Um, you know, I, I do think that it's sometimes too much of a reaction to think every every seeming obstacle to voting will become uh, something that hurts turnout. And I, I think in the case of early voting, absentee voting, you see that. A lot of states even who promote that. Oregon and uh, Washington State who do a lot of voting by mail think this is the greatest turnout thing ever. And they, they try to make that case, although I think that's, you know, it has not been the case. May, maybe other good reasons to do those re uh, reforms, but I don't think that's, that's the case. You know, on the other side, I do think things like uh, same-day registration, you know, there is evidence that there is some turnout boost. I don't want to tell you that it's, uh, you know, 20% increase, it's you know, still all around the margins, but you know, there's been a fair amount of research on this, and, and, and you know, I think those on the right, Republicans have to you know, take some of those things seriously. So not everything that seems like it will remove obstacles is, out, is absolutely good for turnout, but, but some things might be. And I, I do think on the registration side, whether, you know, whether we, you know, people are going to agree on whether there's fraud or not, just being able to have relatively clean election list that people feel want to be on the list, you're on the list, uh, there are opportunities to get on the list, 
but also that we don't have you know messy lists that we don't know about or that, that people who are worried about fraud worry that there are all these you know there's all this dead wood and cartoon characters and other things which are, you know some of which are more important than others but um, <coughs> that sort of thing fixing registration lists and this, the way in which we register and knowing in advance uh, rather than having last minute uh, problems at the at the administrators uh, level of who, who gets on the list or not I think is, is one of the ways that, that this gap could be bridged with it. Yeah, I think though, if, uh, and you know, people believe they, uh, they see UFOs and there may be uh, some flying above uh, the city, but we're not constructing uh, metallic umbrellas to cover the city. I think investigations about potential uh, fraud is necessary, but actually uh, pushing, promoting, enacting, and implementing restrictive photo IDs to address a um, perceived problem is problematic for certain groups. And I haven't read your book. Uh, maybe it'll be under my tree. <laughs> so, but I, I, I do know that if you look at the 2008 election, you will see disproportionately that African Americans in particular uh, did uh, turn out um, uh, using early voting uh, in the 2008 election. And if I can ask John something about that, I, I agree with you that um, I, although I, I would point to what happened in Ohio in 2004 with these ridiculously long lines and, and people having to wait for hours and some people just saying, I, I can't vote, and that, that, that didn't happen in Ohio uh, in, in, in 2008 to the same extent. But I, what, we, in, the Brent, in, our, in our numbers, we actually only focused on a couple of states that um, uh, shortened the early voting period, because I agree with you. Um, Having 30 days of early voting as opposed to 20 days of early voting is not is not necessarily going to have a huge impact on people. But there, it seems to me there's something that appeared so cynical. Um, and Ohio eliminated early the the law would have eliminated early voting um, every Sunday, um, just Sunday. Um, and Florida didn't just shorten its period; it it it, it got rid of that Sunday. Uh, that there was such high turnout among African Americans and Latinos, and uh, um, leaving aside the issue, which I think we all have to be very concerned about, about how many people this is going to impact, um, it, isn't there also just a terrible message um, to the American public about how we're running elections and how we're how we're making the rules for elections with, with something so targeted? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I told you I'm actually in favor of early voting period that would be would run right up to election day, so it would certainly include the Sunday before. Um, and as I said, I, I many of the uh, states that, not the ones that have changed, but have had it for a while, uh, do tend to close down their voting somewhat earlier. And they, they do it a lot on the administrator's side, that they want to, they want some sort of break to set up their election day polling. Um, I guess I'd also note that you know, Florida has increased the, the hours of early voting. And one problem of painting early voting with one brush is that every state does it differently. And there's a lot of early voting that's pretty minimal, right? You go to your clerk's office, and it's not widely publicized. And states don't do it that much. Or that you, you know, have states that really make an effort to have big centers and, and do it extensively for a while, maybe to vote in different locations. So that, you know, there's a huge variety of things. And I guess my, my view is that, that um, I, I don't think you know, the evidence supports in a way that, that it helps turn out at all, but I still think it's a good idea, but it's certainly uh, having a more concentrated, longer hour uh, period at more locations for a short period of time is better than kind of a whole bunch of little voting at polling places or, or at, um, at the clerk's offices for 30 days, which, which wouldn't uh, be nearly as, it wouldn't be as convenient for people. So, um, so I, I don't know that the Sundays were, uh, exactly why the Sundays were illuminated. Florida does have the earlier Sunday there, uh, so it's, it's still, well, I was voting on Sunday in its early voting period, uh, and it has longer hours, and again, longer hours, uh, nobody's really tested the early voting plus longer hours as much, but longer hours in regular voting on election day uh, has been shown, you know, people who vote early morning tend to be a little more high income, people who vote you know, after work tend to be more low income, and so, uh, you know, at nine, you know, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. good long day on election day is, is a worthwhile thing, which I think we should have. And if we had, you know, more, some more hours for a shorter period of time before, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm for Sunday voting. So I, I don't know if it's cynical, but I, but I, 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 
what I re resist is that, that somehow this is a big, that, that this will change turnout dramatically. And, and that, you know, that's, that's a couple million people of your five million, so I, I, um, you know, I'm skeptical that the turnout rates will go down because of those changes. Okay, um, we'd like to open this up now, um, and I guess uh, generally uh, you guys go to the media first here. Um, if you could just identify yourself first and wait for the microphone to come over. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't get to the hold it. <laughs> Only go so far. Exactly. Cut you off. Uh, this is a question for Laura Murphy. A uh, couple of questions. I, I'm sorry, who? who oh, uh, Tom Curry with MSNBC.com. Um, two questions. One is you mentioned uh, Attorney General Holder's speech. You said you're excited about it, you, that you've been pushing him hard. Um, are you expecting that he will? Is it your intuition he's, he's about to make some big effort on uh, using Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to try to uh, challenge uh, laws such as the one in Indiana and the one in Georgia? That's, that's one question. You said, why has there only been one case? And I'm interested in what your thoughts on why there has only been one case. You mean one case during the Obama administration? Yes. And then the other question is, what? I, mean, I know this comes up all the time, but what do you make of the fact that voter turnout increased in Indiana and Georgia after the enactment of the, the photo ID laws? Well, I think um, voter turnout increased in 2008 overall. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised that voter turnout increased, increased among certain segments of the population, among minorities, among students. So I don't know that they're um, I think voter turnout has a lot to do with whether or not it's a presidential year, it's a non-presidential year. So I don't have the statistics about Indiana to really be able to assess who turned out and, and why. Um, all, we don't know what the Attorney General will say. We don't know whether he will bring, the DOJ will bring more Section 2 cases. All we have been doing is telling them that they should and um, asking them to be clear where they can uh, what we see as violations of the Voting Rights Act. So you'd have to ask the Attorney General what he's going to say. But in your view, does Section 2 clearly... Mike, uh, Mike, Mike. Does, does Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act clearly prohibit the kinds of laws that we see in Indiana and Georgia? I think that the Constitution uh, prohibits some of these laws in our interpretation of the Constitution. Clearly the courts don't agree with us, but I also think that there you could bring Section 2 cases in some of these jurisdictions, but you'd have to establish a particular impact on racial minorities because the Voting Rights Act was around issues of race and voting. So you, what we're you know, doing in certain states is collecting data so that we build a great evidentiary record, and um, those, the, that's where the time-consuming part of Section 2 cases comes in. They're, they're not uh, easy cases to bring because you've got to create a record to show a disparate impact of a certain voting change. Okay. Am I answering your question? Yes. Okay. I'm not needing a Oh, you are? Oh, okay. Any? Uh, Craig Gilbert with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Can you talk a little bit more about which of the new voter ID laws in the states are the most problematic from your point of view, which you think may be the most vulnerable to legal challenge, and, and, and whether and how they go beyond, for example, the Indiana law? Uh, I, I guess I would say um, the worst of the laws uh, that have passed so far probably was, I would identify as Wisconsin, um, Texas, uh, maybe Kansas. Um, and, and the reason is because um, they, they don't allow things like, for instance, student IDs. Wisconsin technically allows student IDs, but in fact, they put in so many requirements that no student ID will satisfy. So it, 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 you may not be able to use things like student ID. Um, but, but also because they don't allow any they don't, they don't really allow the alternatives um, that would allow somebody, if they don't have that kind of ID, uh, to go ahead and vote. An advancement project um, did a great job um, identifying in Texas. I think Eddie already mentioned this a little bit, but you know, uh, 
showing um, where where IDs are going to be made available to people, um, how uh, um, far the poorest people and, and African Americans and minority voters will have to travel um, to get those IDs. And remember, these are people that don't don't have driver's licenses. They're not going to drive to the, the location to get IDs. If they have to if they have to travel 100 miles, it's it's by bus or getting somebody to drive them. Um, no, just in, in that the, the Texas in particular is still under review, and comments let, comment letters have been uh, submitted uh, documenting some of those, uh, the, both disparities and the barriers, and so we're waiting for the outcome. Okay, interesting. Oh, Florida is pretty bad, even though it's not a, an ID yeah. situation, but because of the, oh. um, the League of Women Voters is pulled out of Florida yeah. because they're um, put in such extreme criminal penalties uh, for, you know, failing to register the appropriate person and there's no way that they are going to go about uh, their normal bus business activities of registering voters in a state where the consequences are so grave. So I, I think that, that Florida is a pretty outrageous set of suppression um, measures to Uh, Bert Wise, I worked on election and voting rights uh, issues on the Hill for many years. And preliminarily, uh, having rewritten Section 2 in 1982 to overcome a bad Supreme Court decision, I just want to affirm what Laura said, that with the right fact patterns, some of these laws uh, are vulnerable under Section 2. But I have a question for, for John, more at the 30,000 foot level than the details level. Um, you said on a theoretical level, it's important to balance security and access. But I think the real issue is how, on a reality level, to properly frame that. And uh, you also indicated that the ID laws and similar uh, restrictions tend to be popular, uh, which obviously impacts the state legislatures and referendums. But I think you'd agree that's uh, in large part because of the exaggerated claims of fraud. And so I was going to ask you, uh, in light of the Brennan Center's very persuasive, I'd say almost dispositive demonstration that the fraud claims are grossly exaggerated, well, I was going to ask you whether the AEI had put out any formal dispute of them, but you yourself said that it wasn't widespread enough for such a heavy hammer it was exaggerated, not a lot of evidence. And so now my question is whether the AEI and you should help properly frame that balancing issue uh, by publicly saying that these claims of fraud are grossly overstated, not just at an ACS panel, but in a more formal, perhaps publication way, or to paraphrase Lloyd, that there really isn't a lot of beef between the buns. Uh, well, I'll speak for myself, uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't actually think it's a, a good strategy to say, look, there's, there's no fraud, and therefore let's just worry about access. No All those people, no, no significant fraud, no, nothing to worry about. Uh, everything, everything done on the integrity side is uh, malicious. I, I think that's, that's A, not a good, uh, probably, uh, it's certainly not a good political strategy, because many people uh, w whether you think it's true or not that there is fraud, there are many people who worry about this. But, you know, aside from uh, having uh, le le just the mechanisms of voting, I think are, there's a lot to point to that, that people should worry about. I, I, uh, I don't feel comfortable that there are registration lists that are extremely messy. I mean, I think there's lots of reasons from the access side to worry about that, too, that people don't get on right or misspelled. They somehow have problems because of that, but there are uh, lots of people on lists who uh, shouldn't be there. Many of them, it's not malicious. They move around, they have change of names, they uh, we don't take people off the list when we put them on somewhere else. We have, you know, we have all sorts of reasons. So I, I um, you know, I, again, I think there are many of these, uh, the direction of many of these reforms are for uh, making the system 
clean and have people have faith in it and, and whether their worries about fraud are a bit exaggerated, as I say, I think some of the worries about access are a bit exaggerated. We should, we should be for that, but that the numbers and the, the extent of this uh, are probably exaggerated on the other side. So, uh, so I'm, not, I'm not taking up your project, I, I will say that. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I, I will say, you know, I, I you know, can find time to, to call people out. And, uh, if, you're, if you're worried more about fraud, I'd be worried more about the absentee uh, realm. And I think one should be even more careful about that than than voter ID, but I, you know, I think that uh, there. You mentioned the Rhode Island law, which was passed uh, you know, primarily by Democrats. There are better and worse versions of these, and so to, that that uh, laws get at some of these problems is not a, I think, a, a, a bad thing. Uh, registration laws. I, I think the whole registration system's a mess, but it doesn't seem to me crazy that we would be worried about uh, third-party groups acting in ways that are not good for the system, putting people in who don't belong there, people who, uh, you know, uh, not putting in registration lists, the registrations that they don't uh, agree with, or, uh, you know, not knowing, you know, how, how much registration is going on. So, I, you know, I think some of these regulations of registration groups, um, you know, the idea is not a, not one to, to, to seize that. So, I, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think that we need to find a way that to, to, if you're worried about access, I think you should take some of the concerns about integrity seriously and find ways to make some of these things work. But wait a minute, wait a minute. But the, you're, you're acting as though there aren't laws in every state against fraud. So if you're concerned about fraud, let's prosecute fraud. And the reason why more uh, prosecutors haven't prosecuted fraud is because they don't, they, the cases are not being brought to them. So we have federal laws, state laws that bar fraudulent voting practices. So it's not as if we lack the tools to combat fraud, and so we d we, we ought to understand that as a premise. And so I think it so would be... So those are enough. I mean, I just, you know... So, no, so we don't need additional oh, IDs that amount to poll taxes when you have to pay $28 to go to your home state registrar to get a certified copy of a birth certificate so you can qualify for one of these free IDs. This is burdensome, and it's madness, um, unless you're saying that all of these states' attorneys, generals, and the federal government are not prosecuting fraud. And, and the Department of Justice, you know, the, uh, the last administration, which had a, a special project devoted to this and wasn't able to find anything. Right, although, just can I just say, I mean, they, they are pretty difficult cases to prosecute, and often um, there are um, at least evidence that there's fraud that you, you can't actually identify who's committing it. I mean, it, they are difficult cases to bring, right? I mean, well, certainly if you make everybody show a photo ID, you're more likely to um, get people who don't show up for in-person voting, but the allegations out there about what kinds of fraud are going on, like, you know, with voter registration groups or, or, or undocumented people. Those allegations are real, they're made, they're investigated, and they're found not, not to have merit. So the, the, the anti-fraud laws are not voter ID laws because voter ID laws only get to a portion of people who try to show up in person and say yeah, they are somebody they aren't. I, I'm not sure why it's difficult to prove. I mean, this is a we, when we're specifically talking about voter ID, this is a crime of sh actually showing up at the polling right. place, claiming that you're somebody that you're not, that is already listed in the polling place, hoping that nobody notices you and leaving your signature. I mean, the, I, the, I, there's a reason that we don't find very much of it. I, because it, it's a, it's not a very smart crime, all for one vote. I was thinking more in terms of things like absentee voter fraud and stuff like that. Um, also put okay. a tremendous amount of uh, pressure on um, already overworked uh, poll workers to actually look at these IDs and determine that the person actually looks the same way. That, like we have poll workers who now are called upon to be handwriting uh, experts to determine if signatures match, it, even though a person may have been sick um, and, and lost the capacity to write legibly over the years. That's what we've seen in some of the lawsuits already, uh, that, that persons either don't look the same or they, um, their, their handwriting may not be the same. And, and, and so we're just putting a tremendous amount of uh, pressure on these election administration systems and poll workers in particular. Hi, I'm Paul Ramshaw. 
an informed citizen. Uh, to the extent you're, it, it sounds like when you're talking about reforming the registration system, that you're heading towards some nationwide database that's going to have everybody's name and address in it. And are there are you thinking about ways to prevent that from being abused and combined with other lists, like AIDS lists and social security lists? Well, I mean, I I, I think you could. It doesn't have to be a national list. It could be. It could. We we already have statewide registration databases in every state and required by HAVA. So you, you, I can imagine something where um, you're using those statewide databases and just and supplementing them with. Um, uh, DM, Department of Motor Vehicle lists or Social Security lists. Uh, obviously, you have to give you would you would have to give people an opportunity um, to make the choice about whether or not they want to be on that list to opt out if they don't want to be registered. You 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 can't force people to be on a list, um, and you wouldn't want to do that. But I, I think what you can do is just make it much easier um, for people so that when they um, when they go to DMV or they go to a social service agency or any or or to a university. Um, that they're given the option of having that information automatically go to um, uh, the election offices and the, and the statewide um, database, and they're registered. And when they move, same thing. When they move um, and they have a change of address with the post office, that that unless they say, I don't want that to be moved, my registration to be moved, it's moved. Um, and and then then you do have. I mean, frankly, that is what's done in most other. Um, de de industrialized democracies in the world, um, and that's why so many more people are registered in those countries. And, and frankly, there's, there's much higher participation among general citizenship. I, I think there's, um, you know, I, I agree a lot with Larry. And I think they've done, uh, for instance, done some very work on you know, aspects of modernization, like uh, making sure that things are input properly instead of having, you know, if you, if you write out your registration by hand, uh, it's not necessarily the best thing for anybody. If somebody transcribes it wrong, you're not on the list or, or uh, but, you know, I think the, the somehow the, I mean, the, the access side of this would be, let's find everybody who's eligible to vote and just have government put them on the list. Um, and I actually think there should be something semi-attractive on the right for that, because uh, if, if that were done in a way that said, you know, we're finding everybody's eligible, but we're really sure that they're eligible. We know that they've shown this. We know that they're a citizen. We know that they're, you know, residing in whatever place. Um, but I think that's probably, you know, well, much further than we're likely to go, and we're not likely to move to a national list. I mean, I, we've already had enough trouble moving to these state lists. And so I think, you know, one hope is that we might be able to find ways of, of um, uh, using tools of the private sector and other things to, to just find who really lives where and give states access to that. Give states access to the uh, list of people who might be registered voters in their, their states, uh, who might be uh, registered in two places, who might not be eligible, and let, let states have some of the tools that, that they can improve these things. And also let state state registration lists talk to each other a bit. There are some you know, ad hoc projects that do this, but um, I, I'm not, we, we don't have an infrastructure for running elections nationally. I'm not sure we're gonna move to that, but having some uh, ability of states to query uh, smart databases that would that would allow them to a find people who might not be registered and b find people who you know somehow uh, shouldn't be on the lists or or check them out in advance would probably be a smart thing. Any other questions? <coughs> Hi, I'm Brian McPherson, and this question is mostly for John. Uh, I am a uh, perennial volunteer with the Election Protection Hotline. And one of the problems I often uh, get in answering calls from voters is somebody's calling up and wanting to know about voting, the election's coming up in a week or two, and we find out that they aren't registered, they've missed the deadline. And the current system where typically, it's changing, but typically in, in many or, or if not most states, you have to have registered uh, about a month in advance. And that developed at a time where records were all, everything was done by hand, on paper. And do you see a, would you think it advisable to uh, shorten the time period for uh, registration? Well, I mean, I think I mentioned before that there is a uh, you know, fair body of evidence that shows the same day registration has some effect on turnout positive effect. Um, so I 
I think well of it uh, in a way, although I do think that, that you know, to have buy-in across the political spectrum, the other side to that would mean, well, what does that mean that you show up on election day and register? What um, checking out of you in advance has been done? What do you have to show? How do we feel, you know, how do people feel comfortable if people aren't just showing up who are not uh, eligible to vote? Is there time to do the checking? Um, Again, it, uh, I mean, this registration system, if, if it were uh, in place, you know, one, if we were able to do more, more of the proper registering and checking out of people well in advance rather than the last minute, that would take many people out of this situation. But, you know, I, 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 instead of a more uh, uh, system that puts people automatically on the list, I mean, one might imagine a list of pre-cleared people, right? You know, people you know. They live the where they live. They know they're they're eligible, but they somehow have to activate their registration. And you know, if if there were a system in place that were people felt comfortable with, uh, you know, I think that would go a long way to selling something like uh, registration a shorter period before election day or same day registration, where you would show up and they'd say, well, we've already looked into you, and we know that you live here, and we know that you're a citizen, and we know that you're old enough, and and so. Okay, now you're here, and you probably have to show something if you're a first-time voter, right? Um, and, and now you activate yourself. So I, you know, that that's a long way away. But but again, fixing the registration problem and having a, having some more confidence on both sides in the registration, uh, and or kind of a pre-registration system might actually help in that regard. Well, and I, I do think we are moving in that direction in some states already. Um, I, I, I don't know how long it will take, but there. Uh, it, it also has a, it also just has a practical benefit for election administration and election officials. Um, if you talk to election officials, particularly in smaller counties, they might have all of their staff working on before a big election, um, working on processing registration these handwritten registration forms um, just a few weeks before an election, and it's, it's a huge burden. So, um, I, I, it, what John is describing not only has a I think a a, a benefit of being of adding people to the roles and, 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 and making the roles cleaner, uh, but also just making election administration um, less expensive um, and hopefully work better. Well, I think that um, unfortunately we've been told that cut off, so, um, but I'm sure the, uh, the speakers will be around for a few minutes at least, I hope, um, to answer any other questions. So thank you very much and um, I, I hope you all enjoy this.